So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to open this uh, workshop. Um, I've during the past two weeks, I've, I've made this uh, some mini course, which was, uh, let's say, a bit dense. So today, on the contrary, will be some uh, a bit relaxed, uh, soft talk, and uh, we'll describe some work that uh, is some several years old, some recent work too, but something uh, broad audience. So first, let's recall what's the difference of point of view between synthetic and analytic in classical geometry. Okay. It's very fuzzy, but you think of synthetic geometry when you do, like you do in school, uh, geometry with triangles and lines and circles and properties with intersections and distances and angles. And analytic geometry when you put coordinates, equations, you compute and so on. Both points of view are their own advantages. Sometimes you think it's more elegant when you do things synthetically or you have the impression you understand better, but sometimes you have to go to analytic. Let's be more precise. Here and here is an example everybody knows is convexity. Okay, it's not example from geometry, but uh, many geometry questions are related to convexity. So how do you define that something is convex? There is simple definition when you know how to how to differentiate. You define they said that something is convex if the Hessian is non-negative. So second derivative is non-negative. And there is the other definition. You decide that something is convex if the graph is always below the chord. Okay. So we're used to the fact that the two definitions are equivalent, but uh, they have very different properties. This one is obviously local, while well, this one is not, a priori not. This one is effective. I mean, if I give you a function you want to check if it is convex, you compute the Hessian. In general, this is the way you do it, to check convexity. Well, this one is very difficult to check in practice. And this one is quantitative. It gives you a number, the Hessian, which somehow quantifies how convex is your thing. This one, on the other hand, is global. And uh, has, uh, so it's one advantage. Very often you use this. It's, much, it's a very useful starting point. It's more general because this applies also to things which are not differentiable. And also it's more stable. If you take a sequence of convex functions converging, say, pointwise to something, if you try to pass to the limit in this, you don't manage. If you try to pass to the limit in this, it is immediate. OK? So the two points of view have, have their advantages. What about curvature? So start with the basic Gauss curvature, so determinant of the normal mapping for, say, for, the sur for an embedded surface, and then you can generalize this into sectional curvature. You can compute this thing in coordinates. You have formulas and check it is it invariant. So this is analytic definition based on determinant. But you also have a more geometric definition, which is expressed in terms of angles and distances, and here is how it goes. You take a point x. You take two tangent vectors, say unit tangent vectors, u and v. This is the angle, theta. And you start geodesics. And you look at the length between the two geodesics at some time t. And you, so you look the distance between a time t of along one geodesic and time t along the other geodesic. And there is this formula, infinitesimal formula, so it depends on the angle theta, of course. If it was in Euclidean space, you would have just this. But when you have curvature, then you have also this. So there is this kappa. This is, the, this is again, is the Gauss curvature or sectional curvature here. If it is positive, the distance is shorter. If it is negative, the distance is larger. So this is meaning of curvature, sectional curvature. It's the rate of growth or decrease of distances along the geodesic flow and how you compare it to the Euclidean case. Now, this, is not, this was not really the analog of this because this is not infinitesimal definition. This is, global, this is a global property. So here is a global property which goes well with curvature. You compare distances in triangles. So this is carton alexandrov toponogov definition or characterization of sectional curvature bounds. So you take a triangle 
on your manifold, for instance. So these are geodesics. And you drew an isometric triangle in the plane. And you look at the length of the geodesic going from this here to this, to the middle here, to the midpoint, or here from this to the midpoint. OK. And you compare this distance to this distance. So if this one is larger, then this means you are positive curvature. If this one is always smaller, this means negative curvature. So some of you already have seen this joke, but this is the way I explain it often. Imagine these are a people, so this is the tie. It goes from the neck to the middle of the belt. And positive curvature means people are fat, so they have to wear long ties. Okay? So this is a way to see non-negative curvature, positive curvature. And it's again, all curvature is all about the growth of along geodesic. So if it expands less than Euclidean space, this is positive curvature. If it expands more, this is negative curvature. This is true always. This is true at least if you are in simply connected geometry. OK. So this is synthetic point of view on curvature. The previous one was analytic. There is another link with convexity. Curvature bounds can be recast in terms of convexity along geodesics. Or Hessians, for instance, if you look at the square distance functions and you look at their Hessian, if they are always less than what they would be in Euclidean space, this means sectional curvature non negative. So distance is kind of concave, or at least more concave than would be in Euclidean space. This is positive curvature. And why is this useful? So first is more general. You can define curvature bound on non-smooth metric spaces. So many people want to do geometry on spaces which have singularities like cones or spaces like trees. Typically, this will be positive curvature, or well, non-negative curvature. This will be negative curvature. And uh, you can define this in more generality. This is called Alexandrov spaces. It's a metric space in which you have these triangle properties, even though you cannot define uh, you don't have a differentiable structure and no curvature in usual sense. So it's more general, but it's, it's still you can use it. It is usable. And there are many results about geometry of Alexandrov spaces. Boago, Perelman, Gromov, Otsushiya, Petruyin, and other people. There are many things known about geometry of Alexandrov spaces. About geodesics, angles, first and second variation, and so on. So for instance, uh, just two Two simple examples. The Bonnet-Meyer theorem is also true in a non-smooth space. If sectional curvature is bounded below by positive number, then you have a bound on the diameter. The splitting theorem is true in non-smooth spaces. So if you have non-negative curvature and you have a line, then you can factor by this line the space, etc. So you can, even though it's more general, you can still use, use these definitions. And it's more stable these bounds pass to the limit under very weak notions of convergence, it's like the example of the convex functions. To pass to the limit in convex functions, you use the global property. Here is the same. If you want to pass to the limit in your space, you use the, you use the, the global property. So OK, please don't hesitate to interrupt me in case of need. So. To understand what this means, first let me recall the definition of geodesic in a metric space, not necessarily smooth. You just, when you have a, a map, okay, here I was not consistent. Maybe this is not, replace this one by L, anything. So the length of a curve, what you do to compute the length of a curve in metric space, I don't know if everybody sees, you just, split it in many pieces and you add the distances between all pieces like you do when you have to compute curves in real life length in real life okay and you take the supremum as the little pieces become closer and closer this is the length of a curve and uh, if a curve is such that the length is uh, the between the of the curve is the distance between its endpoints it's a geodesic it's the same as to say that it provides you, it gives you an isometry from 0L, say, or 0, 1 to your space. So this is one way to define geodesics in metric space. And you have a good notion of convergence, very useful between metric space, which is Gromov-Hausdorff. 
a sequence of metric spaces converges to another metric space in Kromhoff-Hausdorff dorf topology, if you can find approximate isometries between this space and this space, so an approximate isometry is what? An isometry is something that preserves the distances and is uh, on two. An approximate isometry almost preserves the distances. So when you look at how it changes the distance, there is just a small error, which goes to zero. And it is almost on two. When you look, if, it, uh, if when you, you take a certain point, you ask whether it belongs to the image. Well, maybe it's not in the image of the map, but it's a distance, uh, it's very close to the image of the map. Okay, so this is approximate isometries. So an example, here you have a sphere with a small handle. If the handle becomes very small, this converges to a sphere. If you take a tire, which is very thin, and uh, it becomes thinner and thinner, this converges to a circle. So you can see you can have change of topology, you can have change of dimension. It's very general notion, very useful. And the convergence theorem, which is, which is very easy when you have these definitions, is that when you take Gromov Hausdorff limit of Alexandrov spaces with non negative curvature or non positive, then in the limit it is preserved. Limit of positive curvature gives positive curvature. Limit of negative curvature gives negative curvature. OK? OK. So far, so good. This is standard material, right? Same problem you can recast for partial differential equations, of course. So heat equation, this is an analytic definition. You can also give synthetic definition possibility of uh, to define synthetically the heat equation, so by a property, is to say the low at time t of the Brownian motion process. Other possibility is to say this is the gradient flow of the energy, which is given by the usual Dirichlet, the, this Dirichlet energy. There are other possibilities also. So very often, in some given problem, you are led to choose the synthetic definition on another, and it can be crucial to generalize or pass to the limit uh, for convergence of processes or hydrodynamic limits. OK, often it will be more complicated, of course, than this or this. But very often, get a synthetic reformulation is the key to get the convergence. Now, let's go to Ricci curvature. So how do you define Ricci curvature? Analytic definition is very simple. You take a tangent vector, unit norm, and you define Ricci curvature to be the sum of sectional curvatures where the sum sectional curvature in the plane generated by E and another vector EI such that you have an orthonormal basis of the tangent space E, E2, etc., EN. So this is Ricci curvature. So it's a sum of aver or average of sectional curvatures. You define it here on unit tangent vectors and then you can extend it to a quadratic form on the tangent space. This is analytic definition. What is geometric definition of Ricci curvature? Ricci curvature, so sectional curvature was about distance. Ricci curvature is about distance and measure. There are, here is one way to see it. Jacobian determinant of the exponential map. So we want to see how the geodesic flow distorts the volume not just the distance, but now rather the volume. And uh, we'll, for this, it's most convenient to do it when the initial vector field is a gradient, but this is local statement, so you can think of it's the same as to say is vector field corresponding to a closed one form. So what does it mean? Take from a point x, you start a geodesic, constant speed, so this is exponential map, with initial velocity, grad psi of x, where psi is some function. Then t varies, and I ask what is the Jacobian determinant of this map, and I want to see the evolution of this Jacobian determinant as t evolves. So I look at the Jacobian exponential, Jacobian of the exponential map. I differentiate in time. There is an exercise that you can compute it using Jacobi fields, and 
there is, it gives you that time derivative of Jacobian is given by Jacobian itself multiplied by the trace of a certain matrix. This matrix satisfies the Riccati equation. And when you take the trace of the equation, it involves Ricci curvature. Time derivative of the trace of the matrix plus trace of u square plus Ricci equals zero. So this is a way to understand Ricci from geometric point of view. It controls the rate of growth of the volume measure along the geodesic flow. Very often you use it in an ana equivalent Eulerian form. So if you're used to language of fluid mechanics, this is Lagrangian. I go along trajectories of particles. Now this is Eulerian. I'm interested only in the vector field, so grad psi. And this is the, analog the equivalent formula is the Bochner formula, which expresses some, okay, which involves the Hessian, the Laplace operator, the gradient, and Laplace again. And this is Ricci. So this is one way, one more geometric way to define Ricci curvature. And in practice, this is very often what you use. So, yes, question? Oh, here, so here is picture you can keep in mind. You are here. You are observing some light source. The geodesics are distorted by curvature effects. You don't know it. You try to reconstruct the source, and you overestimate it because the things are curved. This is positive curvature. In positive curvature, you always overestimate the size of the light source. You can make sense of this in a very precise way using distortion coefficients and saying that distortion coefficients are always bounded below by one, so you always overestimate is the same as saying rich is non-negative. Okay. Here I said only rich in a negative. Very often what you use is more precise bounds that tell you Ricci bounded below by k, dimension bounded above by n. And a very popular way to encode this is by uh, some inequality deduced from Bochner formula. Gamma 2 of psi bounded below by k gamma of psi plus lapsus psi square divided by n, your dimension where gamma is the, if you wish, the Dirichlet bilinear form, grad f, grad g. And gamma 2 is uh, what you obtain by looking of uh, the action of Laplace on the Dirichlet form and say that it is not the same as the Dirichlet form applied to f and the Laplace operator, because Laplace is not a derivation operator. So these guys measure the fact that Laplace operator is not a derivation and uh, you have this bound. And this bound is very useful, is used in particular in probability theory. Okay. So gamma of psi is the gamma of psi psi. Gamma of psi is gamma of psi psi, exactly. And gamma two psi also is gamma two psi psi. Okay. And this accommodates very well with changes of reference measure or effective dimension. So if you decide you want to work with another operator than Laplace operator, the operator with invariant measure exponential minus V, you change your Laplace operator by this operator in the formula. If you decide you want to pretend you're not in the dimension you are in, you change this dimension by some other dimension and you change the volume measure by some uh, other volume measure. And you get this uh, Ricci, new Ricci tensor, which incorporates the dimension and the reference measure. For instance, Gaussian measure on R, in many respects, it behaved like it was infinite dimensional. So capital N equals infinity is natural choice if you're interested in Gaussian measure. Okay, so this is bakri emery ricci tensor. Now, question, what is the synthetic formulation of Ricci bounds? I described you some basic geometric meaning of Ricci curvature, but this was still differential. It was not a synthetic formulation. 
So this is problem you find discussed in book by Gromov, in some papers by Chigger and Colding. It's not clear how to globalize these inequalities, inequalities I showed you about the Bochner formula, how to transform them into some global inequality, or maybe in terms of exponential graph psi. But uh, then you ask, how can I get a rich enough family of function psi defined in synthetic way such that this family generates minimizing geodesics when your geodesics are not minimizing, you are completely lost. So these guys should be minimizing for all t, say between 0 and 1, and psi should be defined globally, not just locally. Not clear at all. An answer came from optimal transport theory. So let me explain this. So this is optimal transport. Okay, so this is, these are the two founders of the field. This is Gaspar Monge, this is Leonid Kantorovich. All of them have uh, very, very rich and uh, interesting lives. And here is the basic problem. Okay, now it's very fashionable problem. So I guess most of you have heard about it at least once. So you take two probability measures on some metric space, and you take a cost function, C of x, y. And Monge Kantorovich problem, you want to minimize integral of the cost to go from x to t of x, t is the unknown, integrated against the initial measure. And the constraint is that the image measure by t is equal to the final measure. So you have this, this initial measure. Here you have the final measure. Suppose you want to extract things here to construct something there. And you transport from point x to point y with your transport map. Transport from here to here. This has a certain cost. And the cost is defined by this cost function. Okay? And you want to do this transport at the, at the minimum cost. So given initial and final distributions, transport matter at lowest possible cost. OK? Now, on a manifold, this is a theorem, I think exactly 10 years old now, by uh, Robert McCann. Um, when you take the cost function to be the square distance on Riemannian manifold, where d is a geodesic distance here, generated by Riemannian metric. You have this initial measure, f of x volume dx, this final measure. Then the optimal transport takes the form exponential grad psi, so it's the exponential of a gradient field. You start at x, you go in direction grad psi of x for time 1. You stop at time 1. This psi satisfies a convexity type property, generalized convexity type property, and it is a weak solution of a Monge ampere type equation, which is written here. So it starts like Monge ampere, determinant of Hessian of psi. Psi will be the unknown now. Psi encodes all the information in the optimal transport. Here there is a term depending on the geometry with the Hessian of the square distance. And here in the right hand side, there are the densities. So this is initial density, final density, and some uh, determinant of the exponential map there. So amp, amp is in the boundary condition? There is, there is no boundary condition. Uh, what plays the role of boundary condition is the fact that uh, this, uh, the, the initial measure is mapped into the final measure. If you wish, it's morally, it's like if you ask that the transport map at the initial support to the support of the final map. That there's no boundary condition. Um, this theorem is on, uh, okay, um, either for compact Riemannian manifold, I did not specify compact here, or for compactly supported data. But there is no boundary condition. That's how F enters into the equation. Ah, it is here, here. Okay, but the equation is a bit longer, it is here. Yes, yeah, that's the problem with these long equations. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now you see connection with the previous problem. This generates naturally, and in a very simple way, some maps of the form exponential grad psi. 
all you have to take is a measure, another measure, and uh, the cost function, there it is. So for any two measures, you recover a map exponential graph psi. And then you see relation with geometry. Okay. Now, there is also some other thing remarkable about optimal transport on manifolds, uh, or on modular structures too. Take a compact Riemannian manifold, always with a square distance function, cost function. You take two measures, this is mu, this is nu, and you look at the minimum cost, and you take the power one half, then this defines the distance between your initial measure and your final measure. This distance has many names, for instance, Wasserstein distance. So it turns your space of probability measures on in a, into a metric space. And this is a metric which goes with the weak topology of uh, convergence uh, in the sense of against taste functions which are continuous. So this gives a distance on the space of probability measures and it also turns P of M, probability measures, into a geodesic space. So when I take one measure here, one measure there, I can find a geodesic between them in the space of probability measures. So there is something interesting going there on the manifold and something interesting also in the space of probability measures on the manifold. Now, this also is about 10 years ago. Uh, came from, from work uh, of myself with Felix Otto, relation between the Boltzmann entropy and the Ricci curvature. So the geometry of the manifold influences the geometry of the geodesic space, of the geodesic space of made of the probability measures. So geometry here influences the geometry on the space of probability measures above. Exactly, rich in a negative implies convexity of the H functional of Boltzmann. So this is the H functional. We know it well it's from statistical mechanics. So if you have a reference measure, nu, some volume measure or something, if you have mu, another measure, you define the, the information of this one with respect to this one. Coolback information, sometimes it's called, is the integral of rho log rho, where rho is the density. Okay, so remember sectional curvature, sectional curvature on the negative means that the square distance is concave or more concave than in Euclidean space. Reaching a negative is more complicated, it is property in the space of probability measures, convexity of the H functional in the space of probability measures. This is reaching a negative. Okay. So this was our conjecture. So why did we conjecture, we conjectured this with, with, with Otto? Uh, the way we arrived at this was by computing the Hessian. This is what you do when you want to prove convexity. Okay, in this case, it's infinite dimensional. There is no differentiable structure. So the Hessian makes no sense. However, you can compute it. Okay. So formally you compute it and uh, you obtain that the Hessian at some measure, evaluated along some tangent vector, you think of tangent vector as a small variation, is made of two terms. One is always non-negative, and one depends on Ricci. So it is in a way, so of course what I write here is very, is very wrong, but you can think of it in this way. Ricci is like the Hessian of the entropy. I rather you rather think of it as the yeah, second f uh, uh, second variation along a constant speed geodesic. If you want to, I mean, uh, you have to specify when you when you differentiate twice along a path depends on your parametrization. So specify it to be a geodesic, and then this fixes the thing. So this was proven after by Cordero, Eroskin, Macken, and Schmuck, and Schlager. And the converse was also proved two years later. Converse was also proved two years later. So this is really a characterization of rich in a negative. So here is the characterization. So if you retain just one thing from this talk, OK. Non-negative Ricci is equivalent to H-functional convex. 
Convex doesn't mean in the sense of uh, uh, convexity with respect to variations of the density. It is convex with respect to variations of optimal transport, geodesic variations in the space of measures. So Ricci curvature on M implies some convexity property on the space of probability measures and is equivalent. So this, if you wish, is a is the synthetic. This is analytic, if you wish, rich in a negative. This is a synthetic, synthetic formulation we were looking for. Because this you can define without any smoothness. It's a global property. Yeah, global property, not on the original manifold. Not on the original manifold, on a much, much larger right. space. Exactly. And this, but this uh, much larger space behaves very well. For instance, if the original manifold converges, then the much larger space converges also and so on. So in physical terms, this is how you represent things. I call this lazy gas experiment. You want to, you want to see if you are in a negative curvature. So you have this, assume you have a cloud of gas has a certain density at time t equals zero. And then you tell the gas, okay, here is another configuration you will be in. You have exactly one minute to get into this configuration. And so uh, do it. So the gas will obey. But he will choose a path of least action because he is lazy. Okay? So we'll try to solve the optimal transport for you. So he minimizes the energy that he spends. And you measure the entropy all along. So at time t equals 1 half, you look what is the configuration of the gas, and you measure the entropy. And you plot the entropy as a function of time, and this function should always be concave. This is the meaning of positive curvature, well, non-negative curvature. And from geometric point of view, what does it mean? Positive curvature means the geodesics, they first separate, then they converge. So at intermediate time, you are more spread. You have more space to spread. And then this is lower density, so higher entropy, in a way. This is the thermodynamical interpretation, if you wish. So this is a way, this is a way to, see, to see. This is the picture for uh, Ricci curvature non-negative. So then you can go on, in particular, and define uh, what it is, the analog of Alexandrov space, non-negative Ricci curvature space. Uh, this was done parallelly by Sturm and by Lott and myself. So here's the definition. A measured compact geodesic space. So you assume it has a distance, so it's metric space, it's compact, and it's a geodesic space. And you put a reference measure on it. You think of it like volume measure. And you define it to have non-negative Ricci curvature in weak sense if, well, the property that you wish. Whenever you take two probability measures in the big space of probability measures, you can find a geodesic in this space of probability measures along which the uh, h function of Boltzmann is convex. So h at time t is bounded above by the linear combination of the h at time 0 and at time 1. So this is a definition, and it captures the essence of Ricci, Ricci bound in the metric measure space. Uh, you can generalize. I will not write the inequalities, but you can define also weak curvature dimension uh, metric measure spaces with CDKN. Morally, this means Ricci bounded below by K, dimension bounded above by N. This is one possible definition, and there is another possible definition, which I will not write, by Olivier, which is also based on optimal transport. Okay. Yes. Sorry? My recollection was that uh, their definition in uh, machines uh, is not working in discrete settings. Yes, but it's easy yeah, to. But, but oh, but well, the problem with discrete setting is that it will never be a, a geodesic space. Mm, okay. However, uh, this is not a serious objection. For instance, imagine you have a discrete space. I will, I will, I will come to it later. It could be an epsilon geodesic space, so you can find epsilon geodesics. And then uh, it's easy to change the definition a bit so that it accommodates. So if you have a certain scale for your space, so it's discrete space, but certain scale that you specify, 
uh, then you input the scale here, so you define this to be true up to a certain error for all uh, the paths which are geodesics up to a certain error. This is how you would do. There are things like this already for, well, this is how you do, and it, and it works. Okay, so why do we do all this? Okay, so what's the use? So first motivation, you can think it's a basic, basic uh, gap which has to be filled. Uh, uh, it gives a local to global principle, a synthetic formulation also for Ricci curvature bounds in the style of what is known for sectional curvature. So sectional curvature bounds in synthetic way have been well understood. Now what about Ricci? So this fills the, this fills the gap. Second, it leads to a stability theorem under weak convergence. So I'll, I'll write the statement a bit later. Then it transforms the Gromov precompactness theorem. There is a, a precompactness theorem of Gromov telling you if you have a family of manifolds such that there is a uniform lower bound on Ricci curvature, a uniform upper bound on diameter, a uniform upper bound on the dimension, then this family is precompact. Now it turns this precompactness theorem into a compactness theorem. You have some description, some large family which contains all the limits. And also it provides a useful point of view to think of Ricci curvature in the sense of these uh, properties of measures is for instance the, the strategy used in proofs of Brumnikovsky inequality and Riemannian manifolds and other, other inequalities. Also, it is more general and applies to new geometric settings that previously were out of the range of Ricci curvature. So in the same way as when I define a convex function uh, with the synthetic way, I can uh, handle non-differential things, it's much more general. Here it's much more general, much, much more general, much more general than Alexander of spaces. For instance, if I take Rn and I equip it with the non-Euclidean norm, then it still satisfies Ricci non-negative in this sense. So CD0n means Ricci non-negative dimension bounded above by n. In particular, then you can, you can apply these tools in Finsler geometries. So Ota and Sturm have been applying these recently, study Finsler geometries using these definitions of Ricci curvature bounds in terms of optimal transport. And also at say philosophical level, it gives some explanation why optimal subleaf inequalities are robust under change of the norm. This is something that was noticed by Gromov, was developed by Cordero, Eroska, Nazare, and myself. And uh, more recently, there are many works about subleaf inequalities based on transport and uh, isoperimetric inequalities. So it all works independently of the norm and this looks strange at first. This is not strange when you think of this. It's always the same Ricci bound, and Ricci bound is exactly what's the basis of Sobolev inequality. And also, it allows some discretization. So, possibility to use Gauss uh, to use Ricci curvature in discrete spaces. Okay. Sorry, what, what is the difference between Ricci and Sobolev inequality? Oh, uh, Ricci, uh, whenever you, you try to establish a Sobolev inequality on a manifold, it's always Ricci lower bounds, which, uh, which enter in all the constants, in all the proofs. So Bolef inequality will fail if you have some region of... Oh, optimal, okay, optimal, I, I, uh, even not, not uh, I don't speak of optimal constants. Here, um, here about optimal constants is well understood, but also for, for sub inequalities in Rn, also optimal constants, if you have lower bound on Ricci, positive, say, this is where case Ricci positive is well understood, then you know the optimal is for, for the sphere and you have the optimal constants corresponding. And the comparison principle is in terms of uh, Ricci. So this is, uh, if you will, this is Levy like in levy gromov isoperimetric inequality. I will come back to it, but levy gromov tells you Ricci bounded below by K positive, dimension bounded above by N. Then all your isoperimetric inequalities are at worst, the same as on the sphere with this Ricci curvature and this dimension. And uh, by the way, it resembles the result of Lewis. Lewis says if I uh, look at a space which is more curved than the Gaussian space, in the sense that uh, the measure is more log concave, then uh, 
then uh, these all the inequalities are not worse in this space than in the Gaussian space. And uh, if you think of it, it's a Ricci statement too. Okay. I, I Okay, yeah, 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 Louis, Louis, Louis is behind. Okay, Louis, Louis tells you mar much more. He tells you there is a one Lipschitz map from one space to the other. Oh, really, really. And from this, you have everything, all the inequalities you want. Oops. Um, I think I did something wrong. Okay, it's okay. Okay, so this is the result of Jan, very recent result of Yann Olivier. If you take the hypercube, hypercube is a metric space. Distance between two points is the Hamming distance, so you, you number of coordinates that differ. Then this has Ricci bounded below by 1 over n at scale O of 1. This is, is so an answer to a question that was asked uh, 10 years ago by uh, Dan Struck. What is Ricci curvature of hypercube? And why you want to do this? Because you want to understand sub-ref inequalities or log sub-ref inequalities in the hypercube. So at, at first, for the first time, there is this uh, geometric understanding of Ricci in discrete spaces. Okay. And even though it's a weak notion, it is still usable. So for this definition of, uh, of a weak uh, Ricci curvature bounds that we did with Sturm and Lot, with Lot and then Sturm, you can derive sub ref inequalities, diameter control, Lichnirovitz inequality, volume growth estimate, concentration inequalities, log sub ref inequalities. So for the, to go back again to the, to the question of Sergio, for instance, okay, I gave this definition. This definition just tells you if I have a measure here, measure there, I find the geodesic in the space of measures under which there is some convexity. Okay, if you replace the n with dimension n, you replace entropy by some other function. Uh, this definition in itself implies some log sub ref inequality or some sub ref inequality. You don't a priori have no differentiable structure, but you can still define a generalized gradient and you still have a sub ref inequality. Is the minimum required is this Ricci bound. Okay, so here's the stability. So I state it in, uh, for smooth because even for smooth manifolds, uh, this is the only known way to prove it. So you take a sequence of manifolds which converges to a manifold in gromov hausdorff topology, measured gromov hausdorff topology. Now the good concept is measured gromov hausdorff topology. I recall the definition here. It's just as gromov hausdorff topology, but you impose in addition that your approximate isometries uh, almost preserve the measure. So the push forward of this measure goes converges to this reference measure. So if all the manifolds have non-negative Ricci, then also the limit has non-negative Ricci. So this is stability theorem. And uh, yes, so it would be obvious in C2 topology. As soon as you are below C2 topology, it is not obvious. And uh, you can see all the more it's not obvious that this is false if you replace lower bound by upper bound. This is an old result of low camp. Ricci non-positive does not pass to the limit. Which in a negative passes to the limit. And related to the fact that there is no synthetic formulation of Ricci non positive, there is one for Ricci non negative. Okay. So the proof, strategy of the proof is crystal clear. I will just uh, say, say, say uh, it in a, in a few minutes. So first, you reformulate the curvature condition. You turn it into this geodesic property, so it's synthetic property. And then you use the fact that the space of probability measures is stable under gromov hausdorff convergence. So when my space, when the base space converges, I have some approximate isometries, then I look at the map which is pushed forward by this. So it's a map which sends the probability measure to another probability measure. So it's a map in the space of probability measures. Then it is also an approximate isometry between this space and this space. So an approximate isometry below gives rise to an approximate isometry above. And then you have compactness. And in particular, you gain a limit geodesic in the space of measures because geodesics are very stable objects. 
geometrics converge to geodesics in Gromov Hausdorff topology. And step three, use properties of entropy to pass to the limit. And because everything in this problem is convex, it's very stable. So this is a property. If you take a continuous convex function and you look at the integral of u of the density against the volume, then this gives something which is lower semi-continuous, not just in mu. It is jointly lower semi-continuous in mu and nu. So you can pass to the limit both in this and in the reference measure. And also it satisfies a contraction principle. So if I take a push forward of mu and a push forward uh, of nu, this can only reduce the value. Very well known property for the Boltzmann entropy, but it works also for any continuous convex function. Okay. And then you pass to the limit, and the lead property reaching the negative holds in the limit. Okay, of course there are details that are, are more complicated, but the, the, you see the outline is crystal clear. Yes? The result is also true with, uh, with no compactness. You, 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 it's natural to formulate. Uh, you, you reduce to compactness uh, when you do it not compactness. Um, and you use a local version of uh, gromov hausdorff convergence. Usually in non-compact situations, geometers use the pointed gromov hausdorff convergence. But here this is not the correct notion. Pointed notion is good in locally compact setting, but the space of probability measures is not locally compact. So the good notion is a bit, is a strengthening of this. I will, I can explain to you the Problem. It's good to add synthetic definitions, but then you want to make sure they are compatible. So here's a problem. You take a geodesic space with sectional curvature non negative in weak sense, so it's metric space. Let n be its Hausdorff dimension. Question. Does it have Ricci curvature non-negative in the weak sense of Lodge, Turm, and myself? Okay. So, of course, this sectional non-negative should imply Ricci non-negative. So the problem stood open for some time and was just solved uh, last month by Anton Petrounin, who uses uh, so a lot of... Uh, of geometry in Alexander spaces. So, so the fact that there is almost everywhere differentiable structure and some inequalities between gradient flows generated by solution of Hamilton Jacobi to replace Jacobian determinant of geodesic flow. Okay. The proof, the proof is interesting because it gives you a better understanding even in the smooth case of what is going on. So these definitions are compatible. What about heat equation now? I told you about heat equation. Now there is also some synthetic formulation of heat equation related to this. So this is a reformulation of an old result by, well, of a result of Jordan Kinderlehrer Otto in the 90s. Heat equation is the gradient flow of the Boltzmann functional in the space of probability measures equipped with the optimal transport structure. So you think of heat equation in the space of measures, it's a gradient flow for the Boltzmann functional. So heat equation is the flow that wants to make the entropy e increase as fast as possible. They have a discrete formulation. Now it, uh, after work of Ambrosio and collaborators, it is uh, well understood how to do it in non-discrete, to give it a non-discrete sense. There are the both, bo both points of view are possible. Uh, discrete point of view and, and uh, non-discrete point of view. Okay, goes back. Discrete point of view goes back to De Georgi and, uh, and many other people. The other point of view goes back, I think, to Benilan, uh, formulated in terms of variational inequalities, and it makes sense even without discretization. So reaching the negative in particular means to heat equation being a contraction in optimal transport distance. Okay, interesting thing. If you take a manifold such that Ricci has some negative regions, then the heat equation is not a contraction. But you can say, okay, but let's correct this. So you would allow a change in the metric to make it a contraction so that the, the, so that the measures feel like it's non-negatively curved. And then you get the Ricci flow from this procedure. This is uh, an observation by McCann and Topping. 
So in a sense, there is also a synthetic understanding of Ricci flow related to this. And synthetic, yes. Topology. What? But you cannot do topology with this. What do you mean topology? Okay, you oh. So use Ricci flow to understand the topology of your. Yes. Well. Well, this kind of thing is more to get to get intuition, and then when you have the intuition, you work on proving the thing by some other other scheme. But some parts of the proof of Perelman can be reinterpreted in terms of optimal transport, and some there is some recent work of topping uh, using op uh, optimal transport to get some new results on Ricci flow. Okay, so, so what's the Perelman hypothesis? What's the what's the what's the okay? So this is more it has more to do with the. With the L distance of Perelman, so uh, Perelman defines this thing, which he calls uh, which is called L distance, um, which uh, is uh, like uh, it's a Lagrangian action in which you put the scalar curvature in your uh, plus kinetic energy, and uh, this is the notion exactly that you get to that. It's okay, say say if if in all optimal transport statements you replace square distance by this thing, then you get you get the correct things. Okay. Robert can say more about this. Okay. I will give you another example of synthetic formulation which popped up much more recently. So in the past few years, some new curvature condition appeared in the regularity theory of optimal transport. And some object, Matrudinger one curvature. Okay, I will not write the expression unless you ask. It's expressed in terms of derivatives of order 2, 3, and 4 of the square distance. And the non condition that this curvature is non-negative is a non-local generalization of sectional curvature non-negative, is a reinforcement. It is rarely satisfied, only very particular manifolds satisfy it, or we know very few examples. And it comes close to be necessary and sufficient for regularity theory of optimal transport. So if there is some region of negative curvature, there is no regularity theory for optimal transport. It also has some purely geometric implications, in particular about the shape of the tangent cat locus. So it's, we discovered this with Grégoire Le Père. When the condition is enforced, and in certain particular cases, this forces the tangent cat locus to be the boundary of a convex set. So very strong geometric property in this sense. I will not say more, but assume you want to pass to the limit in this condition. It's non-local and it's fourth order. So it's very difficult to pass to the limit. Even C4 convergence of the manifold, you cannot pass to the limit directly because of issues about focalization. 